Hi, my name is Konstantin Baum. I'm a master of wine and today I'm going to take you back to one of the most traumatic moments in my life. I will take you behind the scenes of one of the most difficult exams in the world. I will show you how I passed the master of wine tasting exam while also tasting some wines from that exam. So let's get it on. So nice to see you again. If you like my videos and haven't subscribed to my channel yet, then please do. It really supports this channel and helps me make more exciting wine content. The Master of Wine is one of the highest regarded qualifications in the wine world. The exams were first held in 1953 and today there are 416 Masters of Wine living in 31 different countries. I used to say that there were more people that went to space than people who have passed the Master of Wine and that is still true, but it seems less impressive today as every other billionaire currently goes to space. There are so few masters of wine in the world because the exam is very difficult. They used to say that less than 10% of all master of wine students eventually end up becoming a master of wine. And that is also, or maybe even mainly due to the very, very difficult tasting exam. It's the most extensive tasting exam in the wine world as you have to identify 36 different wines blind. There's no list of wines that you have to know. Everything is possible. There was a Chateau Lafitte 1989 in an exam, but there was also a Lambrusco in the lineup when I passed the exam. You might get an Assyrtico from Santorini or a Viognier from South Australia. That said, everything is possible apart from the homebrewed plonk I made last year. The only way you can prepare for such a vast amount of different wines is to taste a lot and focus on your weaknesses. There are hundreds of relevant wine growing regions and you can't be an expert in all of them, so you really have to concentrate on the stuff you don't know. For me at that time, it was South Africa, Greece and fortified wines, for example. As a Master of Wine student, you start to develop a map in your mind that should take you to the right wine. We call it the funnel, as you start off broad and then get narrower and narrower. For white wines, for example, I started off by asking myself, is this an aromatic or a non-aromatic grape variety? For red wines, I asked myself, is this a dark colored grape variety or a light colored grape variety? Then I went into varieties, winemaking, regions, and so on and so on. On the day of the exam, you have to develop a routine that prepares yourself physically and mentally. I went to bed early, did not have any aromatic or spicy food, even though I'm not really sure whether that would have impacted my tasting ability. I did have coffee though, as I always do. In the morning, after brushing my teeth, I primed my mouth with a dry, non-aromatic white wine in order to prepare my palate for the tasting. The next important step is that you have to learn how to perform under pressure. On three consecutive days, you have two hours, 15 minutes in order to identify 12 different wines blind. You also have to write a great explanation on how you came to that conclusion. The questions are, for example, wines one and two are from the same country but from different regions and different single grape varieties. For each wine, identify the origin as closely as possible and grape variety. For both wines, compare and contrast quality and style with reference to wine easy you do not know anything about the wines they are put from numbered carafes so you don't even see the bottle shape and you will not be able to peek onto your neighbor's exam sheet even if you wanted to needless to say this is very stressful and you cannot start panicking as you will not be able to smell or taste anything so you have to learn to relax yourself I did a lot of blind tastings in order to prepare myself for the exam and I learned that failure is fine you just have to stay cool and trust your senses I remember being scared of the exam, but when I sat down and had the wines in front of me, I looked around and relaxed. It's quite beautiful to watch a group of experts in their field doing something they've prepared for for years. Watching a group of Master of Wine students do a blind tasting is a little bit like watching NBA players running across the field, shooting, passing and dribbling. Of course, these experts didn't look like athletes and they were gurgling fermented grape juice between their red wine stained teeth instead of windmill dunking a ball but you get the point. You have to be aware of time always as you have 2 hours 15 minutes which is 12 minutes per wine which is not enough time if you have to make important decisions and write great tasting notes. To give you a little bit more context, this is an example from a mock tasting that I did before the actual exam. The pale cherry red color with a hint of garnet evolution on the watery rim points to a thin skinned varietal. The vivid notes of ripe red cherries, raspberries and blueberries along with a floral lift and forest floor and mushroom notes points to Pinot Noir. The perfumed palette with medium light body and fresh acid and moderate tannins 
and silky texture is consistent with the varietal. The light spice aroma suggesting maturation in French oak is in line with the varietal's affinity to oak. That's it. So now let's see whether I still got it. My wife went through some old tasting papers and bought some wines that were included in past exams. I don't know anything about the wines apart from the fact that two wines are from paper one, which is white wines, two wines are from paper two, which is red wines, and two wines are from paper three, which is a mix of different styles. I will taste the wines and we'll see whether I can identify them. I have a bit of a blocked nose, which of course ranks number one as the most frequently used excuse when you're expecting to fail in a blind tasting, but let's go. Wow, how does this always happen? <laughs> So one of the most important things in the Master of Wine tasting is that you number your glasses. I numbered my glasses before pouring the wine to be sure that number one stays number one. The worst thing that could ever happen is that you identify the right wines but have them in the wrong order. So do number your glasses. So the first thing I did in the exam was I smelled all of the wines in order to find bankers, wines that I could identify pretty easily and I think wine number two, wine number five and maybe even wine number six could be considered bankers, wines that I can probably even identify just by smelling them alone but then I uh, still have to taste them in order to be sure that I was right with my first impression. Okay so wine number two is very aromatic, it has flavors of gooseberries, cut grass, a little bit of cat's pee, there's also some passion fruit flavor here. So I think some of you might already know where I'm going. For me, this is pretty classic Sauvignon Blanc from Marlboro in New Zealand. So it combines a lot of fresh flavors, a lot of different components. On the palate, it also reminds me of Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc. The acidity is piercing, quite sharp, but there's also texture, richness, and body there. So I would say this is a Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc, probably from the 2020 vintage because it's still very fresh, very young. So let's see whether I'm right. This would be quite embarrassing as I was so convinced or I am still so convinced, but this looks pretty good. So this is the Villa Maria Sauvignon Blanc Reserve Clifford Bay, Bay from a watery. I almost said a watery because it's so fresh and crisp, crisp and crispness and freshness is for me very much associated with the southern watery valley in Marlboro. So wine number five is the next banker for me. For me, this smells very much of lemon zest, but you also have strong yeasty flavors on the palate. This is really rich and concentrated, a lot of body, not a lot of acidity and this feels like it has something like 15% of alcohol and this style for me brings me directly to sherry. I would say this could be a Fino or a Manzanilla. Manzanilla in my opinion has a little bit more saltiness to it so I would actually say this is a Fino from the sherry region but let's check. So wine number five and it is, it is, it is, drum roll, drum roll, drum roll. A manzanilla. So it is from the sherry region, but it is actually a manzanilla and it is a pretty good manzanilla. So the next one I have strong feelings about is wine number six. It has a pale color, but you can see bubbles coming up. So this is a sparkling wine. It smells of green apple, very fruit driven. You don't have the yeastiness that would be associated with champagne, cava, or for example, a great Winzersekt from Germany. So I think I know where this might be coming from. On the palate, this feeling is confirmed as this is quite a juicy wine with lots of freshness. It doesn't have a lot of alcohol, but there's some residual sugar there. So I would say maybe 15 grams of residual sugar. So I would say this is probably an extra dry wine from Prosecco, from Prosecco DOCG, Conegliano Valle Obiadene, because it's really high quality. It could also be a Prosecco doc, but it, overall, this is a very classic, juicy, complex, vibrant, fresh Prosecco. So let's see. So sparkling wines can be really tricky because a lot of them are actually made after the role model of Champagne. So quite a lot of them taste very similar, but this is different. So let's see whether I was right and uh, was right. It's the Rougerie Valdorbiadene Prosecco Superiore 
extra dry. It has 11.5% of alcohol and I assume it will be around the 15 grams of residual sugar mark. So now that we have the easy stuff out of the way, let's move on to the more tricky wines. Wine number one for me is difficult. Sometimes it really helps to give the wines a little bit more air so that they can unfold their flavor profile. But well, the wine doesn't tell me that much more now than it did before. So now I really have to funnel. So the wine has quite a lot of exotic fruit flavor, but there's also a lot of oak here. So you can really sense that the wine was matured or even fermented and matured in barriques in small oak barrels. And some of them were definitely new. On the palate, it's rich and concentrated, has quite a lot of body, but there's also a real nice freshness and acidity there. For me, this seems more like an old world wine. Flavor profile wise, I would maybe put this into Bordeaux, white Bordeaux. It could also be something like Condrieu, just from the smell, but the texture is much more vibrant and fresh. Condrieu would be more fat and rich, so I would rule that out. It could also be a white Rioja. White Rioja tends to be aged in oak barrels. This has quite a lot of oak flavor, and there's also some coconut and sweet oak flavors coming through, so this might point more to Rioja, where they use American oak barrels that have these flavors. It definitely has some age, so it could be five to six years old, and I will decide that this is a white Rioja, but I'm not really convinced. Let's have a look. So this bottle could be Bordeaux from the looks of it, but um, let's see. Oh, Allende Rioja. It is quite an aromatic Rioja, but um, it's a blend of Viura and Malvasia. I have tasted white Riojas that tasted more like white Riojas in my opinion, but um, this is pretty good. Red wines tend to be a bit more difficult in my opinion. White wines you can often judge by the flavor alone. So you really have to feel the wine on your palate, judge the tannins and the structure in order to decide which grape variety this was made from or which region the wine could be coming from. So the next one I'm going to tackle is wine number four. It has a pretty pale color which already points me into a direction. It could be Pinot Noir. It could maybe also be Grenache. I mean, it smells of cherries, blackberries. There's some smokiness as well, which suggests aging in barriques or maybe big wooden casks. This is quite classic for Pinot Noir. So this points me kind of in the direction of Pinot. On the palate, it's rich and concentrated velvety, there are not many tannins. Tasting it again and again, I am more and more convinced that it is from the old world, um, but I don't really, I'm not 100% sure where to put it. I think it could actually be from the south of Burgundy. Um, it's definitely not a super high-end wine. It's not like a Premier Cru or Grand Cru wine, in my opinion. It's more of a, an entry-level, maybe village uh, quality wine. Um, but it could also be from Germany. I could see this coming from Baden, from the south of Baden, for example, but it's tricky. But in the end, you have to make a decision. And I would probably say this is Pinot Noir from Baden. Let's find out whether I'm right. Okay. Boom. Oh. Okay. So I'm halfway right. So this is Pinot Noir, but from the Mosel. So it's Maximin Grünhauser's Pinot Noir. Um, it's the entry level Pinot Noir, so I was right with this. It's a pretty good wine, but a bit of a surprise. Mosel Pinot is not that widely available, so I didn't even think about Mosel Pinot, to be honest. And it has 14% of alcohol, which is quite a lot. So now on to the final opponent, the last wine in the tasting, wine number three. And I'm still not really sure what to do with this. This is really not easy. For me, this smells and tastes of the old world. New world wines tend to be a little bit more plusher, more precise maybe. This is a bit more wild. For me, it smells and tastes like something from the south of France, but it doesn't really have the body and concentration of a southern French wine. So it could maybe be something from Cahors, which is made from Malbec and is very much influenced by the Atlantic Ocean. So 
yeah, I really am not sure, but if I have to say something, then I might just go it's a cow. Let's see. So, wine number three, the last wine, and it was definitely not my best performance, but let's see what I... Oh, freaking hell, I'm completely wrong. This is just so... Well, I'm really wrong here. This is Rubicon 2017 from Merlust from South Africa. And as I said earlier, South Africa wasn't my strength when I practiced for the Master of Wine and it apparently still isn't. So this is Stellenbosch and I believe this is a Bordeaux Cuvée, um, but I'm not 100% sure. So I was completely wrong, not even in the right hemisphere. And as you can see here, even a Master of Wine messes up from time to time. Blind tastings are really difficult and sometimes you just get it wrong. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, then please like it down here. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of my subscribers, all of the people who are commenting on a regular basis. You are great. My question of the day is, what kind of blind tasting should I do next? Let me know down below. I hope I see you guys again soon. Until then, I'll be tasting more South African wines and you stay thirsty. Cheers. Thank you.